Hey, New Life Church, we are glad that you joined us this morning. In just a moment, John McGuire will be teaching, and we are continuing in this series called Express Yourself. You say, where do we get this from? Well, we're going to be going through the fruit of the Spirit for the next couple months. And we started it by establishing that the fruit of the Spirit is love, divinely expressed in these different things. And last week, if you haven't um, been following with us, I encourage you to go on the app, watch it on demand, watch the first two weeks because it sets up really the rest of the, the series. And so we talked about love and then last week we talked about joy and this week we're going to talk about peace. And I believe over these next couple of weeks, peace and patience, um, it's, it's gonna, you're gonna, your mind's going to be changed about what you're reading. And so I'm excited for what God's wanting to do as he transforms the way that we think. And so before we go any further this morning, just want to bring you up to speed on a couple things, okay? Um, some of you have just been struggling to, to make connection again. And I want to encourage you just by, by saying this. Um, if you want it, we have plenty of opportunities for it. And so if you're a man, we have Monday nights and Tuesday mornings at the Bible studies happening at the offices. If you're a woman on Wednesday nights, um, there's a Bible study happening for you. If you're a young person, middle school or high school or even college age, we invite you out to our youth groups, our youth um, small groups. And so there's plenty of opportunities to get involved and get connected. And so we hope that you'll make that a priority in your weeks to come. I know that this next week's a little bit busy with 4th of July coming up and all the things that happen around that time, but make it a priority. Put it on your calendar, mark it, open your phone up, put it in your phone. So put an alert to remind you, but make Monday nights, Tuesday nights, or one of the Sunday or Wednesdays with the youth priority during this time. Hey, before we go any further, I want to just take some time and pray, and then we're going to take some time and worship, and then after that, John will uh, be up to speak. And so I'm excited, excited for what God has for you this morning. Jesus, we thank you for today. I thank you that you brought us to this place, wherever that place may be. And we thank you that, God, because of what you've done, because of you sending your Holy Spirit, God, you're everywhere with us. So God, thank you that we can be in community everywhere we are. Thank you for technology that allows us to do what we do. Thank you for providing for us to be able to purchase the things that we need. God, what we're saying is thank you for your faithfulness over and over again. And so today, God, would you draw our hearts closer to you? And God, would you transform the way that we think? God, we want to see transformation not only in our lives, but in our community, in our nation, and in our world. So Father, have your way in me starting today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you take some time and would you just worship this morning with Blake? We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. Oh, oh. We're going to shout out your praise. Oh, oh. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross And he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away There was joy in the house of the Lord There was joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There is joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet we're going to shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. 
We're gonna shout out your praise. Oh, we're gonna shout out your praise. Oh, cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. So let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. So let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. Oh, oh. We're going to shout out your praise. Oh, oh. We're going to shout out your praise. Oh, oh. We're going to shout out your praise. Gonna shout out your praise. Hey, this morning is Graduate Sunday. And so in just a moment, we're gonna put some pictures up on the screen. And we were trying to think, how do we do this with being online? Because we love uh, to be in person. We love to lay hands on people and just pray over them. And so as you see the picture come up on the screen this morning, here's what I encourage you to do. Would you just take a moment and pray for them? Would you pray for their futures? Would you pray that the plans that God has for him, that he would begin to lay out each and every step? And I can't wait to see what God is going to do with this group of kids because the potential inside of them is great. And so would you just take a moment as we play these things, would you just take a moment and pray with us together? We're going to be praying right here, but we're also going to be praying together in person uh, over these young people. conflict between the mask and no mask. Well, now there's the conflict between the shot and no shot, vax, no vax. It just seems like the world is filled with conflict right now. Um, Republican, Democrat, build a wall, don't build a wall, open borders, closed borders, drugs, liberty, pro-life, 
pro-choice, Republican, Democrat, critical race theory, racism. These are just like conflicts in our culture. And those are just the social American civil society issues for conflict. There's world conflict, global conflicts. Right now there's 29 wars that are going on. And the wars defined as um, 100 casualties or more. Um, 100 to 999 casualties happening around the globe today. Uh, there's this human versus uh, computer conflict. There's uh, social uh, social action conflict. There are all these conflicts around our world today. There's government versus freedom or um, globalization versus sovereignty, all of these conflicts going head to head against each other. And then it transfers over into our families, into our work, work conflict, even leisure conflict. How many times have you seen on the news where some people who were just having a party or some people who went to a club and all of a sudden a fight broke out? Um, Conflict is just part of what our culture is. And Christian world is no different. Um, there are all of these levels of, uh, well, at least we don't do it like they did it. Or, um, you know, they're not doing church the way we're doing church. So they're not really doing it right. And so there starts to be this, this conflict, Christian versus secular. Well, where did this come from? Where did these ideas uh, about conflict come from and what does it have to do with what we're going to study together today about the word peace. Uh, Romans says this, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone, be at peace with everyone. That's the command. That's the standard that a Christian is supposed to follow. I'm not sure I'm seeing that standard as it relates to all these social issues, as it relates to world issues, as it relates to family issues, as it relates to work issues, as it relates to leisure time issues. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. This is the spiritual level. This is the instruction from the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, verse 18. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. This word peace is this uh, Greek word, irene. Uh, it, um, it carries the understanding of the word peace. Uh, it means absence of conflict. Um, and the opposition to that word is the word enmity or hostis, where we get the idea of hostility, or hostage, or taking, taking your enemy hostage, or hostility. Um, it's um, not hosting um, <laughs> hostis. Um, the idea of peace, Irene, and enmity, hostis, is this word in Koinini Greek, which means the absence of conflict, or hosti hostility, which is conflict. In the uh, in the ancient Hebrew, the word is peace, um, shalom, which means the reestablishment of the broken relationship. It means peace through relationship. It means um, regaining the relationship that was broken, shalom. And the opposite of the word shalom in ancient Hebrew is iba. Um, it's this idea of a... Um, a hostility, a, um, a broken, separated thing. How did enmity come to mankind? How did this broken, separate thing come into mankind? Why is it that we today fight over everything? Why is it that we just have this natural hostility? Why is it that we think people are always out to get us? Uh, why is it that we always bristle at ideas that are different from our ideas, our thoughts that are different than our thoughts. What is it? Where did this enmity come to mankind? Well, 
uh, we go to the original account, um, which is in the book of Genesis. It's the, uh, the account of the fall of man. Well, Genesis 1 and 2 is the story of creation, the story of each day, God creating different things. And then ultimately on the sixth day, he creates man and he places him in this perfect place that is called Eden, which Eden in the Hebrew just means paradise or um, pleasure. Um, so it was this very pleasurable place where God had planted mankind. Uh, he creates man out of the dust of the ground. He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and man becomes a living being. And uh, at that place, he then takes, uh, causes a deep sleep to fall in Adam. Uh, scripture records that he took a rib from Adam and he made it, uh, fashioned it, formed it into woman. And then he brought the woman to the man and the two began to um, procreate. The, the two began to uh, rule in the garden and um, in this place that was paradise. Uh, this place that was full of joy, this place that was full of love, this place that was full of peace. It was Eden. It was paradise. Um, then God said to man, you can eat from anything in the garden, but of this one tree, you can't eat. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you do eat from it is the day you will die. Uh, so this becomes this will man trust that everything that God has for them is perfect, that it is paradise, or will there be this thing that rises up in man that makes him doubt whether or not there really is paradise? Well, uh, the devil um, comes uh, in the form of a serpent and tempts Eve, and in Genesis chapter 3 is the account of the fall of mankind. Uh, the devil says, are you sure that he really said that? And uh, she tells him what he said. And then, and then uh, the, the serpent tempts Eve to take from the tree. He's just worried that when you eat of it, you will understand what good and evil is. Yes, that's for sure. Because all you have understood, Eve, uh, in the parentheses, in the asterisk, if you follow the asterisk, you would have known, Eve, that everything in this garden was eaten. Everything in this garden was paradise. Everything in this garden was perfect. So when you take from this, when you decide to go your own way instead of going God's way, um, what you get is the opposite of all of the things that you once had. So you really eat of it in order to get the knowledge of evil because everything that you've known is good. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This is a really interesting cut, kind of uh, flowery imagery to kind of just say, whoa, they just realized what evil was. When they only knew what love was, now they start to understand what hate is. When they only knew what joy was, they start to understand what sorrow or regret is as you see them responding in this way. Where they only knew what peace was, now enters in this thing called Eva, which is this thing called hostility. Eva enmity, hostility, uh, to become an enemy. So once you were a friend, a friend who took walks with God in the cool of the day, and now you have disobeyed him, now you have gone your own way instead of listening to his way, and you suddenly are coming face to face with what evil is, and you have become this separated person from God's standard, enmity, Eba. Where did this enmity come from? Well, in a similar way that uh, when you turn off a light switch in a well-lit room in, at night, the darkness doesn't overtake the light. The light just leaves. And there was the darkness that was always there before the light was there. In the similar kind of way, enmity comes when the peace leaves when the relationship was broken, when the shalom is gone, 
when the relationship has been severed because of disobedience, when the relationship has been severed because of something that God calls sin or iniquity, wrong, when that comes flooding in, enmity comes. The scripture actually says the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first time a prophecy about the Messiah will come, but it's just basically saying there'll always be these two groups of people, the ones who follow after me and the ones who do not follow after me. There'll be this enmity between these two groups of people because you helped create this enmity between mankind and God. You brought in the darkness. You, and from this, from her seed, will come someone who will crush you, Satan, will crush you, the serpent, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You may think you've put him to death, but he will crush your head. Well, what was mankind's response to God in and others as a result of this enmity. We find it from the very next story about the sons of Adam and Eve um, being jealous of one another and one son actually being so jealous of the offering that Abel offered uh, and Cain who grew fruit and uh, grew plants and grew vegetables and offered that as an offering and Abel who offered a, a blood sacrifice um, and the blood sacrifice was accepted and Cain's offering was not accepted. And so Cain kills Abel, kill, murder, enmity. And one after another, after another story that follows leads us to this point in, um, in Genesis chapter six through Genesis chapter eight that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So there's been generations now who have lived and uh, they do all of these evil things. They all act on their own. The evil that was rushed in by way of, of Adam and Eve, um, peace is no longer there. Enmity reigns on the earth and the Lord saw the wickedness of man is great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Well, that was man's response. What was Yahweh's response to mankind's enmity? So God looks out, he sees mankind as evil. The thoughts of their hearts are evil continually. He regrets that he had even made mankind because they just have gone so at enmity with him. Uh, but as he looks out, he sees Noah and he says, I'm going to keep my shalom. I'm going to restore my shalom through this man, Noah. And he challenges Noah to trust him and to build an ark, which he does. What's Yahweh's response when man comes with him with enmity? Yahweh's response is shalom. Shalom that rescues Noah, his three sons, his wife, and, and his son's three wives, and two of every kind of creature on the earth through the ark, uh, through this saving boat to rescue mankind. Shalom. What he could have done? Destroy the earth. Start over. What he did? Shalom. Um, find a way to still believe in mankind, to have this enmity restored through shalom. So after the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat, it, the record shows that um, Noah and his family and the animals leave the ark and begin to establish this new, uh, this new world through this family. And um, the response then is to God, and God's response to mankind is shalom. In fact, God says, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, uh, Noah had built this altar um, and he said, I'll never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. He just kind of said, I recognize that man has this bent toward enmity, but I'll never destroy them again. I'll never strike down every living creature 
again. And as a sign, as a covenant, he puts in the sky uh, the rainbow. To this day, rainbows are from this account. When God said, "I," when you see this promise, the rainbow, um, the promise is that I will never again seek to destroy mankind because my intention in my heart, he recognizes that man's intention is evil in his heart. Well, so God responds again with shalom. And uh, mankind kind of leaves the ark and they kind of go their different ways. At one point, they even have so much thought about themselves and the greatness of themselves that they start to build a, a tower to, to the heavens to reach God, kind of like they have this new uh, wisdom and God causes confusion. And that's where the languages come from. And that's where the nations start to develop. Um, and from that moment these nations start to kind of go their own way again um enmity uh, enmity just continues to roll and so um the enmity builds and builds and builds until finally god says i'm going to show my love to one family and so he makes this covenant um picks this guy out of um modern day iran um and says to him, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I'll curse. And in all of the families of the earth and in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. He, he just says to him, I'm going to show my shalom. I'm going to establish this powerful, strong relationship with you and all of your descendants. And from someone in your family, I will bless all the earth. But even more, all of the earth will be blessed because of your family, because of your heritage, because of those people who come from you. It's this covenant with Abraham. And this covenant with Abraham develops over time and the family um, uh, gets um, taken or moves to Egypt and in Egypt they become enslaved and for 425 years they're in Egypt enslaved and um, then God calls Moses out of um, the, the children of Israel and um, and he calls him to go and rescue the people because he's heard the cry of the people he has a shalom relationship with and so they are rescued out of Egypt. They go pass through the Red Sea. They're out in the wilderness waiting to go to a land that God had promised them, the promised land. And while they're out there in the wilderness, God meets with Moses on the mountain. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers on their children, the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. It starts to put in place this covenant love for mankind. So what's mankind's response to God and to others? Shalom. Should they have shalom for one another? Actually, no. In fact, they kind of go the opposite way. They start into this enmity again with God. Um, we would like a king God, um, like all the other nations have. They start looking around. Instead of kind of like understanding that God was their king, uh, they want a king. They want their own king. And so they kind of push off God. Um, they build a temple to God, and then they don't worship him um, with their lives. They don't follow this shalom they don't become the nation that will change the earth they become a nation changed by the world around them and ultimately they become a nation that god sends prophets to to try to tell them to to straighten out um this is a passage from jeremiah the Lord said to me, proclaim all the words in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his own evil heart. Therefore, I brought upon them all the words of this covenant, which I command them to do. 
but they did not. So mankind's response to God's shalom is enmity. Enmity with other nations, keeping others outside, not keeping their the corners of their fields open to the immigrants, um, not allowing non-Jews to be in the temple area, um, not inviting other nations, uh, not blessing the world like they were intended to. Um, they continue this enmity, acting opposite of what God's desires are, even to the point of idolatry. Um, in fact, the temple becomes one of those really key places and something called machatsa, uh, the dividing wall, um, becomes really prevalent, becomes this dividing of something in half. According to Josephus at the time of Jesus, there was these dividing walls. There were these walls that kept Gentiles away from Jews in the Jewish courtyard. There were these dividing walls between the men and the women in the courtyard. And what God had meant to be peace started to become these walls of hostility that grew up between the people and between the nations and between the women and the men um, and between Jewish groups um, and uh, the division just continued. The enmity just continued. What was Yahweh's response to mankind's enmity? Well, interestingly enough, his, his first response was that they would have to be taken away into captivity, but then he would bring them back to their own home, to their own place, back to Jerusalem, and he'd begin to restore the temple area, and he'd begin to restore man. God's response to mankind was shalom, and in the process, through the prophets, he began to tell them about something that was going to come that would change absolutely everything, that there would be one who would come who would be have an anointing on them, and they would be called Messiah. They would be called the one who would bring about what God had always intended for the kingdom. It was the one that was talked about in the garden who would crush Satan's head. It was the one who would save, like happened to know. It was the promise that all the nations of the earth, not just the Jewish nation, but all the nations of the earth would be blessed through the Israel people, Israel, Israelite people. Um, it was the one who would share his personal name and would love like um, was intended to be loved and would bring peace like was intended to have peace and would bring joy like was intended to have joy. And this Messiah would come with the shalom of God. Isaiah 9, 6 says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Shalom, the, the one who reigns over Shalom. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Shalom, there will be no end to his shalom on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. He was saying there is one coming who will be the prince of peace, who will bring peace that will never go away. Isaiah 53 verse 4 to 6 goes on to explain about the Messiah. And it says this Messiah will arrive differently than we expect. He will be a man of sorrows. He'll be acquainted with grief. He will bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us shalom and with his wounds were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of Christ. It's spoken that there'll be this Messiah who will be the Prince of Peace, who will come and he will bring us peace. On him will be the chastisement of our iniquity, of our sin, of our wrong, of our enmity. He will bring us peace.
Well, we know that this shalom comes true. It comes true in the person of Jesus, in the birth and in the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In fact, John went to describe it like this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Now he was not about condemnation. He was about shalom. He did not come to bring enmity. He did not come to bring hostility. He came to bring love. He came to bring peace. He came to bring joy. He did not come to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have shalom, Irene, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We who were hostile in hostile territory with God have been brought close. We've been, we've had peace made. We've had the condemnation removed. We've had the hostility taken away. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through what he did on the cross. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into the grace that we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What was mankind's response to God and others from this, um, this giving of God's son, this dying on the cross, this rising from the dead? What has been mankind's response to God and to others? Have those who witnessed it taken this same peace, this same love, this same joy? What has been their response? Well, John 1 records, he was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Yeah, being born of God, being, um, being born again, takes you from the enemy's family and places you into God's family. What should be the children of God's response to God and to others then? Should it be enmity and hostility or should it be peace and shalom? Um, this series called Express Yourself. In other words, if you are a believer, then you're going to express yourself in certain ways. This is one of those ways. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, irene, is shalom. It is this restoration of relationship, it is that the believers um, are seeking to not be hostile people, not be the enemies, not be the ones who are working to divide things, but they're the ones who are working to bring things together, that they're working to restore peace, they're working to, to calm the levels, to um, ease the tensions, and not create the tensions, not um, drive more hostility because the very fruit that comes from them, like this wall, um, the Hebrew word for, um, for hostility, for Eba, means to build a wall, to separate. Um, this dividing wall that has been between us now, is there's this fruit and it's on the other side of the wall, but once you're on the side of the wall where the fruit is, you can now taste from the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Ephesians 4, 2 says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of shalom, through the bond of irene. Uh, do everything you can to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Maybe this is in your family. Maybe this is at work. Maybe this is in culture. Maybe this is in our world. Maybe this is at your leisure time. Whatever it is, um, move. Let it, let us move away from the hostility. Um, since we've been redeemed from the hostility, since God was good enough to bring us from that camp of hostility into the camp of peace, would we uh, we need to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of Irene of peace, because there is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one, um, 
you were called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of our God, who is over all and through all and in all. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it is this idea that there are these walls that we build up around us, one brick at a time, one brick at a time, one brick at a time, that can be removed one brick at a time. And I remember once a, a really good friend talking about racism, and he was an African-American friend, and he said, in the same way that you build a wall between us, you can remove those walls. And, and someone approached him and said, uh, he, his history was that he was part of the Black Panther movement in the 60s, and now he was a pastor who was reaching out across racial divides and was uh, working to bring churches together. People said, that must be really, really hard. And he said, you know, what I found is that if I keep removing the bricks one at a time, it becomes a wall that's short enough for me to step over. That's the idea of what is accomplished through the bond of peace that we find in Jesus Christ. Well, um, Ephesians chapter 3 says that, uh, reminds us what this looked like. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, you were excluded from citizenship and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, you were on the other side of the wall, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our shalom. He himself is our Irene. He himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Earlier in the chapter, it said um, they used to refer to each other as the cut. Oh, you haven't been cut down there. You're not like us. You're different. You're the Jews who are still uncut, <laughs> uncircumcised. You, you're not really followers of God because you haven't been, you haven't gotten cut. He has taken these two groups that used to be divided and he has brought us together through his son, Jesus. Um, has, he's destroyed this barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, and seriously using this illustration of the dividing wall that was in the temple. And he said, he's taken that wall down. By setting aside in the flesh the law with its commands and regulations, uh, not setting them aside, not, not putting them away, but rather like making those the reason, because now the reason that you become part of the family, that there's no longer hostility with God, there is peace now with God, is because now you have come to faith in Jesus Christ. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making shalom thus making Irene, or thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. That's a beautiful picture. This is maybe the most powerful picture of them all about this hostility. He reconciled both of them to God through the cross. It's as if there were two cliffs with a sets of people living on opposite sides. And there was no bridge to bring the two together, but the cross is laid across that chasm. And now there is this bridge putting to death the hostility, putting to death the difference because they have now found their place. They have found their peace with God. And now um, God is moved in with them. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Well, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. Uh, we're supposed to be people of peace. Uh, we conclude with the command that we started with, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, love, colon, peace. Um, so the concept is that we, by love, would be people of peace to everyone, everywhere, um, that we would be the people who keep the bond of peace in this culture, not um, those who promote hostility or those who are always up for the fight, um, but rather those who seek peace in all things, whether that's 
um, civil, uh, community, whether that's national or around the world, or whether that's um, within our families or within our work or within our schools or within our um, leisure, that we would be these people of peace. My prayer is that as we express ourselves um, as believers in our culture, that we would be the people of peace, um, that we would seek the shalom of God, that we would want the Irene of Jesus to you so fill up a room that people would begin the process of going, if this is what heaven is like, or if this is just a piece of what heaven is like, that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven, that God, through his son Jesus, came to establish this. I want this. I want to be part of it. I want to be involved in it. I want to live for all eternity in a place of peace. To that end, let me just uh, close with prayer. Dear God, I just pray for those who are listening right now, that you would create in them this sense of peace, peace that you have put in our hearts for those who believe, peace uh, that passes all understanding, your, your word says, that we would become people who pursue peace and seek peace and pray for peace and work toward peace in all things, in every instant. And we ask this in the strong name of Jesus who holds all power, all dominion, and all authority as the Prince of Peace. Jesus, Prince of Peace, Messiah. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Be lifted. 
lifted higher Be lifted up Be lifted higher Higher and higher Be lifted up Be lifted up come to you we lift up your name and we say there is none greater none higher than you Lord we love you Jesus and we pray that you would open our eyes Lord to your amazing word and will We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us, Lord God. 
so that we may see you as you are, see ourselves as we are in need of you, Lord, and see the world as it is, Lord God, in need of you. We love you, Jesus, for your mercy and your grace that you don't leave us where we're at. We thank you for that, and we thank you for your abundance, Lord God. In your name we pray, Jesus, everything. Amen. As we close this morning, I want to bring us back to a scripture that we talked about last week. And it's in 1 Peter, I believe, where Peter is talking about peace. And he says, don't worry about anything. But in everything, pray, right? And he said, and then the peace of God that transcends all understanding may guard your heart and mind. My prayer, just as John says, I pray that the peace of God just floods your life. And I pray that you protect that peace. That you do whatever you can to stay in this place of peace. And for what reason? Well, for one reason and one reason only. It's because of the love that you've experienced from your Heavenly Father that sets you at peace. So you don't have to worry because He's got it taken care of. You don't have to like, get anxious any longer because why? Because He knows everything you need. So peace. That's what we desire. That's what we want. And as John said, man, as people can just see peace coming from our lives, man, it will, ch it will change things because they would want a piece of what we have. And what we have is only given to us because of Jesus Christ. Great word this morning. Hey, before you tune out, we just got a couple things. As I said earlier, find a way to get connected in a group this week or even next week. Put it in your phone, set a reminder, do whatever you need to do to get connected. No more excuses, no more reasons why you can't do something. Get involved, get connected, get back in community. It's, it's super, super important for you and for me. And so this morning also, if you wanna give, you can do that as well. Uh, you can do that through our app or online. You can do it by texting your amount in or by mailing your check-in to the address on the screen. And the last thing I want to say is this, if you're a mom and you have kids and you have some time, uh, Monday mornings at Island Park at 10.30, um, Jessica um, Easter um, meets with just a bunch of ladies there, just for a play date. And so if you have that time, we would love to see you show up at that as well. Um, otherwise, we, we've got some other things happening in the months, in the next week, probably next week we're going to be sharing with you, we're going to be doing some outdoor services in July and August, and so we'll have those dates for you as well. But next week, I want to encourage you, even if you're planning on spending some time at the lake, I encourage you to show up, either online, on this thing, or in person, because the message that Casey Nochi is going to bring about patience is awesome, just to tell you. Like, I, I can't wait till you hear this, because I know how much freedom it's going to bring to each and every person that listens and hears, but not just here, but and puts it into practice. And so I'm excited. So we hope that you have a great week. We hope you have a great time with family and friends enjoying this season, enjoying the freedoms that we have because of many people that have fought for that freedom, freedom but most importantly, the Savior who died so that you and I could be free. So let's, let's live lives that prove and show the world how free we are. So we love you guys. We'll see you back here next week.